Get your Bibles out and go back to 1 Samuel. Um, well, open to 1 Samuel 16 and then let me just, let me just quote Revelation 1-6 to you. Um, go ahead and put Revelation 1-6 up on the screen and I'll wait on you. We've been talking for the last several weeks about what it means to be a king. Now, let's, let's, let's stop for a minute and think about what the Word of God says about being a king. We don't have kings in America today. And, and we read about kings, and it seems like every, um, every f- fantasy, like Cinderella or some book, always has uh, kings in it. We have presidents, and governors, and mayors. So therefore, it seems like the word king doesn't, doesn't really fit our life like it, like it should. It's just a word to us, kind of like a guy with a, with a crown. But actually, it, it means the person who's over everything. Now, after Jesus rose from the dead, he said these words, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. For a while, Satan ruled the earth. Now, right now, he's the God of the age. There's people he rules over, but not his church. Now, Jesus is king. That means he's ruler. That means he's the boss. That's a powerful thought. Not only is he the boss, when you think about that, because if you work someplace, you have somebody, you call them the boss man or the boss woman. And if you own a business, you be the boss. And that's your job to, to, to run things. But as far as the universe, Jesus is the boss. Yes. Now, he made a statement in the book of Revelations that I don't think the church has ever grasped. I want you to look at this. He made us kings and priests to his God. In other words, if Jesus is the ruler, we have become the under ruler. Now, most Christians don't rule much of nothing. Let's be honest. That's why I'm preaching this. Because God left you in charge. There are things that need to get done, and he left the church to do it. And so he gave you authority to get the job done. That means you have the right to to make laws and to be the boss. And some of you women are going, yes. I knew that was in the Bible, you know. I'll go home and tell my husband right now, I am the boss. All right, of the dishes, amen. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Just the children, no. Now look at this, this is a powerful scripture when you begin to read it. It says, and he made us kings and priests to God. Now, the, the, the world does not have any knowledge of what a church is. Most Christians do not know what a church is. Jesus said, I'll build my church, my church, and the gates of hell won't stand against it. We're a new race that never existed before. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creation, a new species. We're a race that up until Jesus didn't exist. Not a black race. Not a white race, not Puerto Ricans, Christians. And, and not only that, but we're a race in the earth of kings and priests and rulers. That's who we are. Now, it's not enough to try to explain the world who we are. We don't even know who we are. Now, there are things when you get born again, God begins to train you to be a king. It's very powerful for you to understand he has a plan, but you're not always ready for the plan. He'll give you what he's going to do with you, but most of us aren't ready for it when he gives it to us. So there's training. I call it test. That's probably not the best word because the word test has been misused so much. We've been taught that God sends test good and bad things to train us. He does not, but he does use the things in life. He has a plan for you to grow in God and to learn things that before you were born again, you didn't know that. So he's training you to sit with him in heavenly places and rule and reign with him. Now that's a powerful thought. I just left most Christians and most preachers in the dirt. 
Most Christians have never even had that thought. Now, there's a scripture in the Bible that we have misused so bad, and it has damaged Christians more than any, just, I wouldn't say more than anything else. We're just waiting on the Lord. There is a scripture, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, but it means waiter, like wait, minister to the Lord. There is a time that we are waiting on the Lord for certain things. When it comes to personal things in your life, there is a waiting period. If you're in school, you need to wait to get married. There is just things that we need to wait on. But most of the time, your waiting is really you sitting around doing nothing and God's doing nothing and nothing's getting done. And that's, that's where, the, that's where this, this, this sitting around, just, we're just waiting on the Lord is, is absolutely killing you. If you're waiting on him, you're backing up. Okay. So because of that, we are kings. Now, the, there is a development process, and I have been going through this process. Pop one more, put one more scripture on for me, Romans 5, 17, and I'll wait on you. Um, I want to read these because I want you to see them on the screen. I'd love for you to read them out of your Bible. I'd love for you to, to meditate on them. Meditating on the Bible creates an image in you. That image, you, you, it, without that image, you are living out right now the, the image you have of you in you. That's, that's what you are doing at this moment. Before God can change your life, he's got to change the image you have in you of you. And the Bible is the only book that will change that image that God has of you and you have of you into who you are. Now, you, now that's a mouthful. So this scripture, by one man's offense, that's Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace, that's us, and the gift of righteousness, that's us, will reign in life. That means that circumstances are subject to you. You are not subject to circumstances. Paul said, I've learned to be uh, 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 content in where I am. That's really a bad translation. It, the literal translation, I've learned to be independent of the circumstance. If the circumstance is there and it's not lining up with God, we are the change agents that walk in there and go, this will change. Now, that's actually called the authority of the believer for the ones of you that want to know where to find that in your Bible and where to find it in the bookstore. All right, now go to 1 Samuel 16, 18, and I'm going to read to you because we're talking every morning about, every Sunday morning about King David. How God took a shepherd boy and turned him into a king. You understand that even though Samuel came and anointed David with oil and called him a king and the anointing to be a king, he left and went out and took care of the sheep. He didn't step into being the king the next day. He didn't get up and say, Dad, sorry about the sheep. I got to go to Jerusalem. Let King Saul know that I'm the new boss. Get him out of there. No, you have to understand that even though you're anointed to be someplace, you have to let God put you in it. Yes. Don't get in. Don't try to open your doors before you're ready because you won't be able to handle the job. And I have been guilty of putting people in assignments earlier than they were ready and they failed and it is my fault. It is my fault that people in this church fail because I see the gift in them, but they weren't ready and, and, and I didn't see it. I didn't know that at the time. But I, I've learned now just to sit and wait on God until their spiritual life is up to handle it because anytime you step up, you just meet new devils. Okay? Now, we're going to look at David and, I want, and we're going to look at David because, he's, because most of the time you do not relate to the ministry, five-fold ministry. Most of you guys are, 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 are business owners or you work for someone else or you will never step into a five-fold apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. That's why I didn't use Paul. It's why I didn't use Jesus. Even though we are going to look at those two a little bit today, I want to focus on David because it's easier for you to relate to a physical king than it is a minister. God does the same thing with ministers. He develops them. Okay. Now, there are things that were in David, and God saw them in David, and they're in you. They're in you because you're born again. 
and I want you to know they're in you, but there are, but I'm going to show you the things that God is working on in you so you will cooperate with him in the development process. All right, here's one of the things that, that the Bible says about David. Then one of the servants answered and said, look, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing. Let's stop. One of the things that impresses me is young people picking up musical instruments. Not just getting good enough to sing Kumbaya, but getting good enough to play up here. That, that means something. Now think, let's stop. Let's just get off my sermon for a minute and brag on the youth for a minute. That means while everyone else is goofing off, they're not. Now, I want you to think about um, Tyler and Caleb and some of these guys that have picked up instruments. Not only that, but the girls up there singing. Lisa will tell you, it takes time to go learn the songs and, and to get skilled at anything. When you're, looking, when you're looking at young people, watch what they do with their free time when they're young. And I'll tell you whether they're going to make it when they get older. You can goof off. There's too much video game playing going on on the planet if you want to make it in life. Unless you are going to be a video builder, which every boy dreams of going to work at the video building store. (laughs) And they're all shocked when they grow up and they didn't get to play videos for a living. (laughs) It is the biggest cry day in a house when they have to go to work. End of, end of announcement. Okay. A mighty man of valor, we talked about that last week, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person, and the Lord was with him. Now, these are the characteristics that God saw in David, and they wrote in the Word of God so you would see what it was they saw. We're going to take one of those and only one of them to talk about him today, and that's, that is the term, David was a man of war. Now, even though he was a teenager, when it says that he was ruddy, what that meant, he's fair-skinned and had no pimples yet. That, you know, he had to have been a boy when he killed Goliath. He was not, I, I'm going to tell you, he was between 8 and 11, 12 years old when he did that. He was not very old when he did it. Now, but scholars may disagree, but we don't really know his age other than the fact that he still had a, a girly skin. What? I heard that. <laughs> you know how girls' skin is pretty all their life? Boys' skin's only pretty for a short time. <laughs> then they start growing beards and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, let me get off another subject. If you can't grow a beard, shave. <laughs> let me say it another way. If you have patches of hair, go ahead and get a razor, please. It's not impressive until you fill it in. Okay? All right. That's enough said. That, the youth are looking at each other, seeing if there's any boys over there with hairs. You know, Lisa watched these Hallmark movies, and on all Hallmark movies, all of the guys have a scruffy face. I don't know how they have a three-day growth every day. Do they have razors to keep it three days? I, I knew somebody somewhere. But I have a complaint. If I grow a three-day, she won't kiss me. She goes, I ain't kissing that man. You get in there and shave. That's the, she said, it hurts my face. <laughs> Never mind. That's a note. That's the third announcement for the day that wasn't in the notes. <laughs> but it says that David was a man of war. This does not mean that he had an attitude and he was a bad boy running around picking fights. But there is something about this terminology, a man of war, that we need to look at very closely. Are y'all ready? 
Someone who is not avoiding a conflict, not avoiding hard work, not afraid of the fight, they're willing to run to the fight. Now, in life, there's a fight. Now, if you haven't noticed that, you either hadn't been saved long or we need to pray for you. There's a fight. The Bible talks about fighting the good fight of faith. It talks about put on the whole armor of God. We want to lay down and just complain about how bad life is, and you can't do that. Kings lead people into battle. That's one of the characteristics of a king. He is the first one. He's the front line runner who picks up and says, we're not going to go into bondage for any other nation. We'll go to war before we'll let another nation subdue us. Let's translate that to Christianity. We will go to war before we will ever allow Satan or any tyrannical government to enslave us in the name of Jesus. We're not going to lay down and let stuff just happen. Now that's, that's a powerful statement. Jesus was a man of war. He still is. Let me give you a, a, a footprint of, of a future event. When he returns, there will be a hostile takeover of the world. Woo! He will not ask anybody their opinion. He will tell you and I our opinion. Now, they're not used to it yet because the first time he came was a lamb. First time he came, now he came to lay his life down. We got some, we got some fingerprints of him at different points in his life. We're going to look at, at, at Jesus' personality. But Jesus was a, Jesus' personality was not of a, of, a, of a lamb where people just ran over him. When they took him to the cross, he let them do it. And he told him, oh, listen, Leroy. I know his name's not Leroy, but anyway, what a, Herod. He said, why have you not said anything? He said, if I open my mouth, this gig stops. And they thought, yeah, right. He says, you wait, I'll be back. Somebody in California grabbed a hold of that, but Jesus said it first. Yeah, it was a good opportunity to say amen. Y'all are just blowing it today bad. You know we're on TV, don't you? <laughs> now, I'm not going to go there, but you remember in the story in the Bible in Goliath, and we've, we've, we've preached this thing a hundred times, but you know that when Goliath came down and David had told Saul, he says, listen, I'll go fight the guy. And Saul came down and he saw David and he, and, and it just ticked Goliath off. I mean, a kid, I mean, my God, guys, that's all, that's the best you got. And, 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 you know, I mean, you can imagine this guy has, this, this guy has been beating 10 or 15 men up single-handedly all his life and a boy comes out with a slingshot, a boy, Goliath is up there cussing. We can't tell you in church this morning what he said really. He goes, you guys are joking me. And it said David picked up how many stones and he ran at him. Now, I want to say something here. This is extremely powerful. There's an attitude. Faith has an attitude. Faith in God is an attitude. You can see it. When, when, you're, when Jesus is in a house teaching, when four men bring a guy up on the roof and rip the roof off, that's called attitude. He didn't say anything about the roof. I mean, he didn't get onto him. But I mean, when you go, we're going to drop the dude down through the roof. 
we are going to get in his presence. Do you understand? We're going for a miracle and we're not going home without it. That's an attitude. The woman with the issue of blood, if she was caught in public, they'd have stoned her. It, it's, Jesus didn't even know who she was. The lady had an attitude. I mean, now think about this. There's thousands of people around Jesus. She is probably down on her knees going between people's legs. Get, please, move. I, get, get out of the way. I'm trying. I mean, you understand what she had to go through just to get near the guy and to get up there and say, there's his garment and I'm going to grab it. This is, this is a prophet. This is a Bible team. This is the son of God. Who do you think you are running up and snatching on his clothing? She had attitude. But Jesus called attitude faith. People with faith have an attitude. You said, what devil? I will slap you upside your head. You come in my house and mess it with my kids, I will beat your head in. Do you, do you understand me? You coming in my house telling me you putting sickness on me. He ain't putting no sickness on me. What is wrong with you? Don't you know who I am? I'm a son of almighty God. You coming in here messing with me. I am not getting underneath you. Don't you even put none of that mess back in me. I ain't going with you. That's an attitude. Without this attitude, this, without the attitude, you're not going to get anything from God. Okay, right. Well, we're just waiting. Listen, when someone gives an altar call for you to go to heaven and not hell, don't sit there for 10 minutes, you ignorant thing. Get an attitude. I had a man came in here one time and we did not give an altar call. And he met me in the room. He says, what does a man have to do to get saved around here? I said, you have an attitude. He said, I do. I said, let's get saved. Listen, I mean, if someone doesn't get, make a, make a door. Make, if they don't have an altar call, make one. Lisa's mother came to me one time. She said, I got a bottle of oil, and the Bible says to call the elders of the church. You're the elder. I'm calling you. Anoint me. I said, well, you're absolutely right. It never said anything about the preacher asking you if you want to be anointed. It did say, you call him. Yes. Yes, it did. This, you say, oh, I wouldn't dare bother you. Bother. How bad do you want to get it delivered? Bother somebody. Yes. And if they, get, if they get bothered by it, just tell them to get over it. So David, he just looks at Goliath and says, I ain't even going to wait for you to get here. I'm going to run and kill you. <laughs> now, you know, you, I, I, when we get to heaven, if y'all want to, I'm going to download it. I'm going to watch it over and over and over. Listen, when we get to heaven, I'm not going to watch the Avengers movie up there. I don't care anything about all. I ain't going to watch the Hulk. I've already seen mean people before. The Hulk is nothing but a guy with a bad anger problem. Anyway, I, I knew him. <laughs> Personally. I'm going to watch David. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play. Y'all come over for angel food cake and Mana burgers, and we're going to sit back. I want to watch this. Oh, I want to watch the movie of David picking up the rocks and running up to this guy and looking and going, you're too big to miss, sucker. You understand that? And then you know he's got a squeaky voice. You know he, his voice hasn't changed. I'm going to take your head off. <laughs> I mean, I'm being serious. It's in your Bible, you know. And the reason he had more rocks is because Goliath had brothers. And after that big giant fell, all, all the Philistines went, if, if a kid can do that in Israel, we better get out of Dodge. <laughs> I mean, we sent the best we had in, and they went in the children's church and got someone.
I, I, have, I have told people, if you come to my church, the kids in children's church could help you. You don't even have to come up here in the front. You can just go ask one of the kids. Because Jeannie trains them good, boy. I mean, they're it. Tongue-talking, devil-chasing, holy-rolling eight-year-olds. You know what I mean? Pray the wallpaper off the wall in that place in there, you know? Only reason we hide them back there is we don't want y'all to be embarrassed. <laughs> Not at your kids, at yourself. Because <laughs> they're in there with fire on their head on Sunday morning, you know? With y'all, I just see smoke. I think it's the hot air in the cold room. <laughs> All right. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Turn over there. I want to show you something. This is in your Bible. This is all over the place in your Bible. Now, this, this when I read this scripture years ago, this amazed me because I would not have thought this was in there. Jesus, when he was filled with the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Holy Ghost into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, you know, when I read that, I thought, no, I would not have wanted to go out there. But now let's, th let's put the story together. Jesus came here to walk as a man. The minute he got anointed, the Holy Ghost goes, come on, let's go find the devil and beat him up. <laughs> I'll tell you what. If we go out and get hungry for a while, that snake will show up. And when he does, I want you to beat the stew out of him. I want him to know the second Adam has arrived. Now, you know, the, the Holy Ghost has an attitude. He will lead you into a fight. Some of y'all are going, God, I don't like his job. Uh-uh, uh-uh, God put you there. And we know your boss is mean. That's why you're there. We know where you work. Ain't, we know, we understand. I used to work where you work. I know. I've had jobs and I went, God, are you serious? These people are all heathen. He goes, I know. That's why I brought you. You the secret weapon. I have never worked anywhere before I pastored that I didn't have revival. I'm going to make a statement. I'm going to say it again. Everybody that I worked with since the day I got saved, every person either got saved or mad as the devil. <laughs> if, you, if that God sends you in someplace, change it. Amen. I told my boss one time, I said, it's good that you hired me. God is blessing this, co this company because I'm here. That's, that's not arrogance. It's a chance to witness to him. The Holy Ghost led Jesus into the wilderness. Honey, the Holy Ghost is going to lead you into some places and sit you down and say, now here's a demon. I want you to whip it. And you can cry all you want to. And when you get through crying, you're still going to be sitting there with your demon. And God is going to say, I want you to show the devil who you are. And you go, I don't even know who I am. And he goes, well, you better find out. <laughs> That's why you're here, honey. Paul prayed one time, deliver me. He said, no, nah, my grace is enough. He, he didn't tell him no, that he needed to be, have eye disease. He said, let me tell you something, Bubba. I'm the one that gave you the revelation. I'm the one that took you to heaven. I'm the one that gave you all of this. And the devil don't like it. He said, my grace, my anointing is more than enough for all the demons in hell. Stop whining at me and turn around and do something about it, buddy. Amen. Now, when you read Paul's life, he did. Snake bit, shipwrecked, beat, and stoned, but never defeated. Now that's called attitude. Yes. 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 Amen. Some of y'all going, I don't want to be a king. <laughs> Luke 13, 10. Let's turn over there. I want you to read this. You are. Now I want to show you this. I, I read my Bible sometimes maybe different than you do because I'm not educated. I'll come over here. That didn't go on. See, I read it kind of normal. 
I read it like it says. In the Bible, the women were not allowed in the room with the men. In other countries, other than where the gospel is, women are one notch above cattle. And every, everywhere in the world, women are for just making babies and et cetera, et cetera. That's about all they're for. They buy and sell them. Oh, a dowry. There was no such thing as romance in the Bible. Your parents went out and found her and she came and she was wife and there wasn't no such thing as divorce unless the man did it. That changed with Jesus. Now, I want you to look at this because the women, the men are in church. The women are behind the lattice work listening back there if they can hear anything at all. They're not well treated. Jesus goes to church one day. He's in a group of men and he calls a woman into the men's meeting. You're talking about ticking people off. I'm going to make a, he doesn't get along with most churches. If you want him in this one, he's going to upset it. That's why in most churches, if you want the Holy Ghost, they have a special room in the back because the Holy Ghost, even though he's God, has a tendency to mess things up. Especially if you have a plan that's not from him. If your dignity is a demon. Never mind. I was overseas once. I was preaching. I can't remember. I think it was a man got out of his chair on his belly. And he slithered up to the front. Y'all, we, I should take y'all overseas. Y'all are missing stuff. I'm going to say this again. He got down on his belly with his tongue coming out. And he slithered up to me. Oh, you dumb devil. I will cast you. I just stopped the service. Cast the devil out of that man. Set him down. Got him filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, you, you, that's not in the program. Kenny, were you with me at the time we were preaching on the trail and the prostitutes started rolling up down the street? Yes, we won't mention the, the denomination that starts with a B. <laughs> that had invited Kenny and I down on the trail to, to witness on the streets and preach. But a prostitute came up, and, uh, and I think Kenny and I prayed for her, and she fell out in the power. You understand that's not in some people's program. So we, we, we prayed for her, and the power of God hit her, and she started rolling up and down the sidewalk. Remember, she'd roll up the sidewalk and down the sidewalk and rolled up the sidewalk and down the sidewalk. And, and they tried to stop her. And I said, y'all might as well leave her alone until God gets finished with her. Well, they didn't know what to do. See, they looked in the program, and rolling was nowhere in it. <laughs> <laughs> I get humored at people. I do, and, and I enjoy it, especially when God does something and they have no clue what's happening. I could tell you stories all day. What, we ended up getting her, I, I forgot the rest. I just remember her rolling, and they chased her up and down the street trying to stop her. Just leave her alone and let her roll for a while. I mean, demons are coming out of her left. She's a prostitute. We had just cast the devil out of her. That wasn't in the program either. He's teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity. It's called a, infirmity is a spirit. Now, now, I understand, there's most people don't believe that. If you're dealing with it any other way, you're dealing with it wrong. You can't medicate a demon. That didn't go over very well because I just crossed your head. But you know what? You're going to have to get your head in the Bible and get it out of books. Now, we have names for this. Now, on the TV, what, I don't know what the names are. I don't pay any attention to them. What's the woman walking around with this giant elephant following her around? And if she takes this drug, the elephant won't. 
CFP. That's a demon. When that comes on, Lisa, I always go, come out in the name of Jesus. Come out. Leave her alone in Jesus' name. CLPD demon. Whatever your name is, go. I don't know what the neighbors think. They go, hey, he's at it again over there. He's. And the next one. You ever notice they always put them in a swing set and they're always, the they're always in a kayak and, yeah. and, they're, and a demon is killing them. Yeah. Yes. And if they take all these drugs, you, you walk around going, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you I took them drugs and I don't have a care in the world. <laughs> and the demon's in there going, neither do I. <laughs> I know that didn't go over very well. Behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity, been going to church 18 years. Bent over. She in no wise could raise herself up. And we're going to get an attitude out of Jesus. You can, we're going to see an attitude. Go to verse. Go to the next verse. Amen. From the days of John. No, 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 go back. I mean the next one in the lineup, not mine lineup. Lynn. Be patient with me. No, you be, no, you be patient with me. You know, I, I, I keep running people out of the room back there because I, they look at me and go, I can't work with you anymore. I go, well, it's just. So I read a scripture that says love is patient, so I decided to start being patient with these guys. And Jesus saw her. He called her to him. That's illegal. I mean, you talking about get along. He ain't getting along. I mean, he walked in another man's church and took it over. If you do it, you need to be God. And then he said, woman, you're loosed from this infirmity. I mean, he drove that thing out of her. Let's go. Let's go to the next one. And he laid hands on her and she was made straight and glorified God. You would have thought they'd have been happy about that. They're, they're not. Church members are not happy about the power of God. Satan is not happy about the power of God. You can find out how religious you are in a real quick. When we start praying for people and you start looking at your watch. But the ruler of the synagogue got mad. Jesus healed on the Sabbath. And he said, there are six days you ought to work. Come and be healed on the hill. Well, she's been in your church 18 years, Leroy. <laughs> Come on. You had Monday, Sunday, Saturday, Wednesday. <laughs> Keep going on. And the Lord answered, you hypocrite. Now, that wouldn't go over very well. Now, y'all think I'm rough. Y'all ain't met him. I mean, he didn't smile like Joel Osteen when he said it either. <laughs> Hypocrite. <laughs> I mean, he rebuked the sucker. Now, I'm gonna, church service is for sick people, lost people, bound people, yeah. and people that are messed up. That's why we're in here this morning. And if something gets out a little out of order, it's okay. We're, that's why we're in here. That's why we have a 30-minute worship service and not a 10. That's why we receive an offering, because we got to pay for it. It's also the reason why I preach for more than 20 minutes. I'm, y'all, I'm waiting on y'all to get the Word of God so we can get something done in this place. I didn't come to go. I came to grow. All right, hypocrite, two-faced Hypocrite? I mean, that's the word. That's word hypocrite comes from the, the, the Shakespearean days. You know, uh, uh, um, R- R- Romeo and Juliet were played by the same guy. Romeo, Romeo, where are you? I'm over here, baby. <laughs> A little Elvis in there. <laughs> One guy did all the acting. But every time he wanted to change scenes, he changed mask. 
That's a hypocrite. That's called a hypocrisy. The mask that you're putting on to appear to be someone else is a hypocrisy. That's, that's, a, that's a literal word. It means to wear a mask of someone you're not. Jesus said, you got a mask on, you act like you act like you're a leader, you are not. Amen. Hypocrite, doesn't each one of you go out and lose your ass on a on, on a on another day or your donkey and take it to water? My God, I ought to be able to get a woman healed. <laughs> now Jesus is the one that said you took your ass to water. I didn't say you took your ass to water. I wasn't cussing. I'm just reading the Bible. I'm just reading. Gene's got a lot of work to do to get all this out. I'm just being led by the whole Lord. We're talking about a spirit of war. I got one. Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham who's Satan bound? And then he says, you think about this a while, guys. Think about this. 18 years she's been sitting here bound. 18 years and you want to say something because I got her free. You get up and you go home. You find out who you are. Get out of my face. Now listen, Jesus, I'm trying to show you, he had an attitude. And the attitude is, we are not going to allow anyone around us to be captive. Yep. Amen. Amen. That's right. David had an attitude. We are not your servants. We are never going to be your servants. We are not bowing to you. We will kill you first. That is what it says. David was a man of war. Kings are men and women of war. A Christian is a man and a woman of war. Our forefathers told, told uh, what was it, King, Hen King George, take your red coats and get out of here. We are not coming underneath you. That spirit's been lost in this nation because it, because it is gained in Christianity. Christianity brings that spirit with it. That's a heavy thought. Most Christians are really... Quite wimpy. Jesus, just help me, Jesus. Just help me, Jesus. I've been praying for 10 years for you to help me, Jesus. Well, it's obvious one of you needs to move. <laughs> Woo, don't take that off the CD. Now, go, go to Matthew eleven twelve. 12. Now, read this. From the days that is Jesus is talking, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it. Now, that, that, that doesn't mean that we are violent against each other. No, that's right. That's demonic. Yeah. We're talking about an attitude that says, that is mine, and I'm going to take it. Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Now listen to it in the Hebrew. Whatever thing you desire, when you pray, believe you take it. Now. Take it. Yes. Take it. Yes. You want to get born again? Take it. Amen. You want to get healed? Take it. Yes. You tired of the devil? You dr drive him off. Listen. Get up, do something with your attitude, and if you don't like the way it is, make some changes, but it's up, take, you take it. The kingdom, God has given you the kingdom, take it. He's given you the earth, take it. I tell people this all the time, and they, and they look at me like, there's, like I, I apparently am have, have not very humble. I said, I owned I own the ground that I walk on. Amen. When I walk into a job and I'm working somewhere, I'm going to change the atmosphere here. This will become a Christian workplace before I leave. Yes. Well, you have an attitude. Yes, I do. It's called faith. 
Well, what about go into all of the world and take the kingdom there? Our forefathers brought it to America and we took 5% of the world and then we started taking the rest of it. And then one day a bunch of dumb Christians laid down and let Satan in the White House. Started about 40 years ago. Just laying down. Every time they made a law, you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that, you're not allowed to do that. And Christians go, well, it's the law, it's the law. And I, and I go, uh-uh. Right. Hippies were doing drugs and it was against the law. So God got us saved because we don't obey all laws. <laughs> <laughs> they had the right attitude, just the wrong item. We know it's against the law to smoke dope. We're going to do it anyway. Mm-hmm. Now I say, we know it's against the law to preach Jesus, but I'm going to do it anyway. Right. Yeah. And I'm not stopping. That's right. yeah. do, y'all, do you see this? What I'm trying to show you, this is what kings do. Kings rule. Kings do not allow things to rule them. They don't lay down and go, well, they aren't paying the taxes. Oh, well, I guess they didn't feel like it. I don't think so. That's not the way kings rule. It's not the way Jesus rules. In the movie Braveheart, Wallace refused to be taken captive by by England. Rightly so. Policemen today, I want you to think about this. When we hear gunshots, we run. Policemen run to them. When there's a fire, we run from it. Firemen run to it. When there's a bad, when there's a demon, we're not supposed to run from it. We're supposed to be running to it. Amen. Now that you understand, well, I'm talking attitude here. Do y'all see that? That's called a first responder. All right. How am I doing for time? Not very good. Hate that clock. I'm gonna quote three scriptures and I'm gonna show you something. I have a bunch of scriptures here and I don't have. In 2 Timothy 1, it says, you stir up the gift of God. Philippians says, you press forward. James 4, 7 says, you resist the devil. Go to 2 Samuel 23, 8. And I'm going to close with this. Do you remember when the apostle Paul was on the boat? He was a prisoner. Do you all remember the story? He's a prisoner. He's a prisoner. He gets on the boat and he tells the captain, he says, now nah, y'all don't need to be doing this because this is not going to turn out too That's good. Right. And they said, who do you think you are? Now look, when you're, the, when you're in chains and you're trying to tell everybody what to do, you have an attitude. Uh-huh. That's right. I'll come over here and preach. The story is this. The boat got in a mess. Paul went and prayed. At the end of the story, Paul, the prisoner, is running the ship. Now, very, very, very important. Then he gets on the Isle of Melita. Snake bites him, throws it in the fire. He ends up starting a revival, saving everyone's life, starting a church. He, he, he's the prisoner. I was going to say something, but I don't want y'all to agree with me. I have trouble at times with people that, where I go. I seem to think I'm supposed to run everything. <laughs> y'all, don't, y'all believe that, don't you? You understand that? The other day I was shooting at, at IDPA and, the, and the, the head, the president was doing it wrong. <laughs> so I called him on the carpet. It didn't go over well. <laughs> I, I don't know how to not be in charge. It, it just, if you think I'm wrong, you need to hear this because I'm not wrong. You need to be like me. When you go to work, after a while, 
you need to change the place to where people are born again, love Jesus. You need to take over. And I don't mean, now when I say hostile, I don't mean violently, but I mean it's an attitude that says, by the way, boss, this is the way we're going to do this. Second Samuel 23.8. Now, David is a type of Jesus. When he became an outcast, it says that there were 400 men that were all broke, discontented, and their lives were total messes. And they joined to David. These are messed up people. But it wasn't long that the same spirit on David got on them. And they became what called, the Bible calls them mighty men. This is the story of you and I. All right, let's read it. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joseph, Beth, Bathsabeth. I'm glad that my name's Morgan. <laughs> the Taconite. Chief among captains, he was called Adino, the Esnite, because he killed 800 men at one time. Now, that, I, I got to go over there because I got to read this out of my Bible. Y'all just hold it a minute. I got to find it. I want to read it out of my Bible. This is attitude. <laughs> this is some of my favorite scriptures, in case you don't know this. I don't know their names, but this is cool. Son of Dodo. I'm glad that's. Verse 20. Benaniah was, was the son of somebody, the son of a valiant man from somewhere who had done many deeds. He killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. He also had come down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. The lion's in a pit. There is no reason to get in it with him. <laughs> When you come down the road and you see a lion in a pit and you jump in, you have an attitude. <laughs> I think I will just jump in the pit and I'll just kill you. Do you, see, do you see what it means to be a man of war? Something gets on you that says, I just ain't going to even let this lion live in the pit. Let's read the rest of it. I, I want a little time. Can I, have, I got a story I want to read to you all if you all will let me. And he killed an Egyptian, a spectacular man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand, and he went down to him with a staff, took the spear from him, and killed him with it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Shirley. He bad. bad. They ain't, they, the, Listen, Avengers, you ain't got this yet. You are trying to come up with super. They're in your Bible. They're real men. They, this guy got an attitude. He goes, I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a, I'm take your spirit away and kill you with your spirit. I'm out of time, but I want to read this. You want to read this? Yeah, I do. I want you to read it. This is a girl named Kelly Tanner. Come on up here. Get the mic. That Jordan uh, met working at Rock Springs. And she is now traveling around the world preaching the gospel. I don't know how old she is. Probably about Jordan's age. 23. 23. Um, just go ahead and read it. Y'all mind? This is powerful. And then we're going to have a prayer time in here so y'all don't get antsy. I want to. I want to pray for some people this morning. So Yeah, Kelly lives uh, here near Apopka, and uh, she went to church here for a little while. So you, some of you probably had seen her. And then she's always had a desire in her heart to, to go all around the world and to do what's called the world race, where you go all around the world and just preach the gospel. I don't know much about the organization, but, um, you know, Kelly's had some bumps in her life, but she got through them. And... He, this just made me weep yesterday when this blog came up She's on my Facebook. Start again. Now, that's why I, I, want her I probably won't. Cry too. I, I probably won't cry today. So she ended up in Africa. She's on Africa. She's got about sixteen thousand more dollars to to raise to you know to complete the year. But here here goes. 
She says, I've always been sensitive to the spiritual. The spiritual realm feels more real to me than the physical most of the time. I can remember numerous encounters with the darkness growing up, and I don't just mean things going bump in the night. Even on the race, I've had night terrors every month and woke my team up yelling at something I, I, or woke unable to yell because I had an invisible hand over my mouth. It takes a lot to surprise me or shake me up at this point. Demons are predictable. I know that wherever I go and whatever good I try to do, they're going to put up a fight. I found that wherever there's light, darkness cannot be. Where, wherever intervene in my life and others in extravagant, unbelievable, and you know that, sorry, I'm sorry, wherever there's good, evil will try to oppose it. And you know what? I have even more memories of God intervening in my life and others in extravagant, unbelievable, and miraculous ways than I do scary ones. Jesus guaranteed that we would have trouble in this world, so we can expect it. But I figure if I can expect trouble, then I sure can expect God to show up in it. Good. On Saturdays in Zambia, we partner with the youth group at the Contacts Church for Village Evangelism. One particular Saturday, my friend and squad leader, Christina, suggested that we ask God to give us clues. So I'm just going to, I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm just going to say that this is something they do on a regular basis. They go out in the villages, they go out in the parks, and they pray before they go out and say, Lord, what are the clues on who we need to reach, who we need to talk to. And God will give them clues like there's going to be a boy come up with a pink headband or, you know, a yellow hat or a brown straw hat. And, and that's the way they pray. They believe God will answer them. And all of a sudden, he gives them all these clues on these people that are supposed to be coming by with these types of clothing or stuff on their body. So this is what they did. So um, th they did all that, but then everybody was hot. They were thirsty blah, 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 and they said, but there was one more place they needed to go. God had one more person for us to visit. We followed our Zambian friend Matthew into a family's yard and introduced ourselves. They were warm and kind, as most Zambians are, and they gave us their best seats, of course. We barely entered conversation before I heard a thud behind me. We all turned to see a woman lying in the dirt next to the dishes she was cleaning. So many thoughts rushed through my head. Was she laying there before? No, of course not. She must have just fell. Should I go over there? Wait, why isn't her family moving to help her? Is this normal? Is she taking a nap? What the heck is going on? There goes Christina and Matthew. Okay, I'm going over too. As I went over, I knew in my spirit this was a demon wreaking havoc on this woman's life because demons don't like it when Christians show up to come share the gospel. She was paralyzed and unable to speak, and she felt pain when she tried to move or open her mouth. Her family had nothing to say except just pray for her. I sensed this wasn't the first time this has happened, and they were out of ideas. Christina told the spirit to leave and prayed for healing over her body, but the spirit fought. It kept hurting her, and her face twisted in pain. I felt that spirit taunting me. She is mine. What happened next was not motivated by love or fear, but by righteous anger built up over a lifetime. It was like the movies when someone's entire life flashes before their eyes when they're about to die. Every moment of torment and terror and lost sleep came into my memory. Only this wasn't a movie and I wasn't dying. And so I opened my mouth to tell this demon to get out of this woman. But what came out was an enraged scream that startled everyone, including myself. I said, get out of her. Leave her alone. She doesn't belong to you. And I felt it leave. <laughs> this is a little girl. This is a little girl. She weighs about 100 pounds. She's on, a, she's on a wall in a picture out there in the swimming pool. There may have been more spirits oppressing her. I'm not sure, but we continued to pray until she was at peace again. And when her tears stopped and her pain faded, she asked for water. Christina poured my water into her mouth and spoke something so beautifully poetic about being filled up with the living water and never thirsting again. Minutes later, we found out that someone had cursed the water she used to drink and bathe in. But when we left that house, that woman, I don't even know her name, she rose to her feet and danced and rejoiced. She was finally free. Her family was joyous also, saying angels brought us to their house that day, and I think they were right. Now, I'm going to take some time right now. Don't look at the clock for a minute because this is what I'm going to do. It's important. All depression, all depression, 
all confusion. Uh, listen, there's nothing wrong with you. Amen. There's nothing wrong with you. You're the righteousness of God. You've been born again. The accusations, the lies, the condemnation, the hell that you're experiencing in life is demonic in nature. You cannot continue to just lay down and hope tomorrow will become better. It will not. Listen to me. Listen to me. If you're confronted with this stuff, if this stuff is bothering you, and most people it is, it doesn't mean that you have a problem. It only means that there is such a thing as demons in the world. That's all that it means. The devil uses family members. He uses other people. Then he accuses you to you. Until you rise up and go, that is enough. I'm not taking this. I will not have this anymore. There should be no drugs in your house. There should be no homosexuality in your house. There should be no rebellion in your house. There should be no sickness and disease in your house. There should be no poverty in your house. Do you understand me? You're a king and a priest. If you're tired, you're not get Get tired of it. Get tired of it. Get tired of it. Run at it. Pick up the word of God and run at it. It's a giant. Take it out. Yes. Enough is enough, church. Listen. Amen. You're kings. You're sons of God. Don't keep walking into church bound and go home bound. Good God, for Pete's sake, get free. I understand laying in my bed at night, 4 o'clock in the morning in a cold sweat while the devil says, I'm going to kill you and your family and everybody else. I understand that it's hard to get up and pray in tongues and to get motivated. To, but listen, you're either going to do it. Brother Hagin, Jesus appeared to Brother Hagin one time and a demon got between him and Brother Hagin. Started going, yakety, 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 yakety. Jesus, Brother Hagin said, why didn't he do something about it? Why didn't God do something about it? Why didn't he do something about it? Finally, Brother Hayden got tired of it and said, shut up in the name of Jesus, I can't hear him. And the demon fell. And Jesus looked at him and said, if you hadn't have done it, I couldn't. And Brother Hagin said, I misunderstood you. I thought you said if I hadn't have done something, you couldn't. He said, that's what I said. He said, no, sir, I don't believe that. You show it to me in the Bible. And Jesus sat down and explained. Jesus is God sitting in heaven. He's not that. He said, you resist the devil. He said, you cast out devils. He said, you have authority over all the work of the enemy. You can pray till hell freezes over and God's not going to do anything about your problems. Until you move. Until you move. Faith has an attitude. Yes. Amen. I will not live this way. Amen. Do you understand me? Amen. 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 Faith jumps. Faith runs. Faith shouts. Faith prays. Faith sings. Faith dance. Faith is active. The woman with the issue of blood, she went and found him. How many of y'all right now are sitting here, listen, don't get embarrassed. Don't sit there and go, oh, I'm not going to appear like I have a problem because what's everybody going to think? You, that's a demon. Yeah, that is a demon. That's a demon problem. I, I make a complete donkey out of myself every Sunday morning. You can once. <laughs> and I don't even care. I got over a long time ago what you think. That's why I'm free. I wake up in the morning and go, devil, let me tell you something, Bubba. I'm alive with the life and nature of God. I have God in me. My name's written in the Lamb's book of life. I have authority over all the work of the enemy, and I am blessed coming in, and I am blessed going out, and there ain't no demon in hell going to rule me, rule my finances, get out of my checkbook, get out of my kids, get out of my family, get out of my daughters, get out of my grandsons, get out of the church in the name of Jesus. You say, how often do you do that? Pretty much every day. They asked Norval Hayes one time, says, do you still believe there's a demon under every bush? He said, no, I hadn't believed that in years. He said, I believe there's two demons under every bush. <laughs> so we're going to stop right now. We're, we got one minute. How many of y'all have got some stuff you need, you need to deal with? Amen. All of us? Yes. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Lord. All of us. Yes. 
I'm going to say this again. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. David didn't, nobody ever looked at David and said, David, apparently there's something wrong with you if you have a giant in your life. (laughs) Did Paul, was there something wrong with Paul that Satan constantly tried to kill him? The fact that you have a problem proves who you are. God is waiting on you to go, that's enough. Stand on your feet. I shouldn't have had to say that. I was trying to get you to get up all the time. You're just sitting there looking at me. But I hadn't got you totally trained yet. I'm being serious. There's times I went and found Brother Hagin and talked to him because he wasn't coming to my house. I went and found him, said, I'm going to talk. I need to talk to you. I mean, there, there's times I just get aggressive. I need some help. I'm getting it. I'm going to talk to you. If you're walking, I'm talking. Are you all ready? Now, first we're going to pray because we don't want to make this about the devil. We're going to talk to the Father. So get your hands in here and say, Heavenly Father. I want to thank you that today. I learned something. I heard good news. I am a king. I am a ruler. I rule circumstances. They don't rule me. Forgive me. I've allowed some stuff to go on. I didn't know, but I learned today. So today, it stops. I don't allow this. I'm not having poverty. I'm not having sickness. I'm not having devils rule me or my children or my family. I have an attitude. Now, devil, I'm going to put you on notice. No more. Go in Jesus' name. My Bible says I cast out devils. My Bible says I've got authority over all the work of the enemy. I declare I am free. In Jesus' name. Now you go. You get off me. Get off my home. Get off my job. Get off the kids. In the name of Jesus. No more. I'll never lay down again. I will never lay down and let you rule me. I will never again let circumstances push me around. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. I'm a king. I rule and reign. I can have what I say, and I say I am blessed, and I say I am healed, and I said I am free. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. This must become a way of life. Now, I'm not talking about you running around hollering devil sun up, sun down all day. But I'm telling you, the moment you see something come up, you go, "Uh uh-uh, no. You you can do it quite now in the name of Jesus. I don't put up with that trash. I don't put up with that. Don't you stop that now, right now. You stop that. You don't rule them. Now, I used to to spend a lot of time talking to the kids. I don't talk to them much anymore. I talk to the devil, and then I just talk to God, and then I say a lot less to the kids. Because when I see a demon pushing a family member, I go for the throat of that guy. Yeah, and my, you come to my house. You're coming in here in Jesus' name. Lisa and I, we knew this in our head. You know how you know truth, but we didn't act on it. It's okay. I'm not the only one in here that knew it. But honey, there came a day we started acting on it. And we started watching God move. Now we rule and we reign. It's my house. It's my church. It's my kids. They're mine. He's not going to do anything until someone with more authority comes along and makes him stop. Amen. Hey, I love every one of you guys. Y'all are the best. This is the best church in this city. Y'all are the best group of people. Amen. Lisa, take over.